Good morning, Owen. You can start your presentation. Okay, sir. Okay. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes. Good morning, sir. I'll be uh, presenting on massive cocktails, the clinical investigations and radiological evaluations involved. So first we'll go on to the definition of massive cocktail. In literature search, uh, it was shown that uh, coffee... Hello, sir. It was shown that... Continue, continue. It was shown that Cofield et al. Defined, uh, defined massive cocktail as a cocktail with size of more than or equal to 5 centimeter in size. Whereas Gerber et al. defined it as more than or equal to two tendons with complete tear. But the problem with these definitions were that uh, these uh, absolute size of a value of 5 centimeters does not apply to all the population as there is, uh, among different people, there is varying size of cuff sizes as well as uh, the height of the population. So in 2021, in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, it was a, a Delphi consensus study was uh, uh, conducted to find out the exact definition of a massive cocktail. And they came to the conclusion that uh, around the retraction of tendons to the glen up to the level of glenoid ring, measured either in the coronal or axial pain in the MRI, or, and or the present of 67% uh, of the greater tuberosity being exposed as a measure of uh, the... Uh, definition of a massive cup tear. And this could be diagnosed either in a preoperative MRI or intraoperatively during arthroscopy. So uh, th this is a pictorial de de depiction of the subscapularis tear with the retraction up to the glenoid level. Here you can uh, see that the subscapularis has been retracted to the, up to the level of glenoid which uh, constitutes a massive cup tear. And in this picture you can see the uh, greater tuberosity being exposed, 67% of the greater tuberosity being exposed by a massive cocktail. So, as I told you, this can be diagnosed either uh, intraoperatively during arthroscopy or preoperatively during MRI. So, in this picture, in picture B and C, during intra, intra, intraoperative arthroscopy, you can see that the greater tuberosity has been exposed more than 67%. So, that is one criteria. And in uh, picture D, you can see that the cuff has been retracted beyond the level of glenoid. So this is how you diagnose it in arthroscopy. And in preoperative MRI, this is such a coronal image of the MRI showing the so, supraspinatus being retracted till the level of uh, glenoid. And in the axial plane, you can see the subscapularis tear being retracted till the level of glenoid. So this constitutes a definition of a massive cuff tear. Next, coming to the uh, role of... Uh, uh, the the effect of a massive cuff tear in terms of the biomechanics of shoulder. So there are two force couples, the vertical force couple as well as a horizontal force couple. The vertical force couple is by the deltoid uh, pulling the uh, humeral head upwards and it is being balanced and the, glino uh, the humeral head being uh, centered onto the uh, glenoid and co creating a fulcrum that is being acted upon by the supraspinatus as well as the subscapularis and teres minor. So once this is lost in uh, massive cuff tear. This is called the vertical force couple. The uh, humor lid starts migrating upwards and results in anterior superior humeral escape site. And this is the horizontal couple wherein the in the horizontal plane, uh, the subscapularis uh, uh, takes part in internal rotation and the uh, infraspinatus and spinous takes part in external rotation. So there is a balance in the vertical as well as the horizontal plane. So once that is lost, we can see that in this picture, the uh, part B represents the coracoacromial ligament and the coracoacromial arch. So once the vertical force couple is lost, the femoral head uh, proximally migrates due to the unopposed action of the deltoid and uh, arches onto the coracoacromial ligament. And once that is also ruptured, it uh, anterior, anterior superior humeral escape occurs and it uh, results in abutment onto the acromion, which results in acetabularization of the acromion. So there is, th th this explains the cause of pain in uh, massive cup tears, whereas uh, the causes being the irritation of the subacromial bursa, uh, as the, the impingement onto the acromion, the loss of uh, coracoacromial ligament, as well as inferior capsular tightness. All these results in uh, pain during massive cup tear. 
Next, coming to the most common symptom being pseudo paralysis. Uh, pseudo paralysis, again, the definition of pseudo paralysis has not been in consensus in the literature. So, previously, it was defined as an active forward elevation loss of up to 90 degree with preserved passive range of motion without any neurological deficit. This was the previous definition of pseudo paralysis, but no, uh, as the uh, study shown here as uh, done by Bohr et al. as well as uh, Tokish et al. This was a study published in Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. They have uh, again tried to define and clearly uh, differentiate between pseudoparasis and pseudoparalysis. So both are different and we need to know about it. Pseudoparasis is when there is less than 90 degree of active elevation. With there will be full passive elevation, but less than 90 degree of active elevation with without a presence of anterior superior SK. And in pseudo paralysis, there will be zero degrees of active elevation with full passive elevation, and there will be a presence of anterior superior SK. So the differentiating feature being you can see in the figure on the left side uh, in A that is a pseudo paralysis, as the lady is able to uh, there is an active forward elevation of less than 90 degree. Whereas in the figure B, that's a pseudo paralysis. Whereas there is zero degree of active forward elevation, and you can appreciate the anterior, anterior superior humeral SK here. Whereas that will be absent in pseudo paralysis. So these are the differentiating features. And in both, there will not be any neurological impairment, uh, impairment as well as there will be passive elevation will be full. Next, coming to another uh, combined deficit called ILA, ILR, clear, and CLEIR. So this was de defined by Boileau et al. And ILEA stands for isolated loss of forward active forward elevation. And ILER stands for isolated loss of external rotation when there is a combined loss that results in pseudo paralysis. So, as I told you, for the first image, we have been checking the pseudo paralysis in the active forward elevation plane. The, uh, when there is an isolated loss of external rotation, this is the external rotation lattice in 20 degrees of abduction. The examiner external rotates the forearm fully, the shoulder fully, and then asks the patient to keep it. So there is a lag. The uh, arm goes into internal rotation. So when there is a comeback combination of ILEA, isolated loss of external rotation with ILER or ILIR, if there is a combination of either of the two, then it becomes a pseudo paralysis. Uh, this is again the isolated loss of internal rotation. This is the Gerber's test where the patient is asked to uh, bring the uh, forearm towards the uh, back of the patient and try to resist against the patient's uh, the examiner's resistance. And in picture A here, you can see the uh, belly press tying with a 90 degrees of this flexion, again showing a complete tear. This again, the, you can appreciate the anterior uh, superior humeral escape sign on the, on the lady's uh, shoulder. In picture B, you can see there is exaggerated external rotation on the side where there is a complete subscapular tear, which shows uh, uh, an opposed op action of the external rotators. So these all constitute the ILIR. When in combination with an ILEA, with an isolated loss of uh, forward elevation also, that becomes a pseudo paralysis. Uh, finally, for our examination, we should always rule out the cervical spine pathology and C5, especially the forearm supination, should be checked along with shoulder abduction to rule out any cervical pathology. And in deltoid, the power of deltoid as shown is uh, assessed using this test, the Hertel's uh, posterior uh, lag test, wherein the patient is asked to sit and both the arms are uh, asked to be brought into extension. And the patient is asked to hold the position, but the patient won't be able to hold the position in, in cases of deltoid uh, paralysis. And in such cases, the cervical spine pathology also should be ruled out. Next, coming to the shoulder equator concept. Uh, in this, uh, Colin et al. has uh, published a paper wherein he has uh, divided the humeral head into different uh, quadrants. The In type B, you can see it, these are the muscles. You can see I, I'll be pointing toward the muscle. This will be the inferior subscapularis. This is the superior subscapularis. This is the supraspinatus. And on the posterior side, on the posterior side this is infraspinatus and teres minor. So once he has divided this into multiple quadrants, the, the anterior superior quadrant includes the whole of the uh, subscapularis as well as the supraspinatus. The upper quadrant includes the upper part of subscapularis, supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Posterior quadrant similarly includes the uh, supraspinatus and the infra and teres minor. So uh, again, this gives a similar idea wherein you, you see that at least one unit should be required in each of the quadrant to prevent the pseudo paralysis. 
if all the muscles in each quadrants are affected then it results in a pseudo paralysis and the most common type of uh, pattern involved is type b wherein uh, this constitute about 80% of pseudo paralysis uh, 80% of such cases will result in pseudo paralysis when you have loss of full anterior subscapularis as well as supraspinatus and the next common being pattern c wherein the whole of the superior uh, upper subscapularis uh, supraspinatus and infraspinatus is affected then it results in a pseudo paralysis almost 45 percent of the times so uh, again the mo single most important predictor of anterior forward elevation pseudo paralysis he has described as the inferior subscapularis involvement Next, coming to the uh, radiological evaluations. Uh, first, in X-ray, we can see that uh, I was telling you the same previously also. There will be an anterior humeral escape sign when there is unopposed action of the vertical force couple when the cuffs, uh, the opposing vertical couple force have been uh, abolished by supraspinatus and uh, subscapular. So there will be an unopposed action of deltoid. The humeral goes upwards, and in the final stage, there uh, the results in an stabilization of the acromion. And you can see the uh, humor led migration here and the loss of the Gothic curse. The Moloni's line will be broken and the humor led starts migrating approximately. These are the findings that you can find on an X-ray. And coming to the classification of massive cuff tears by X-rays, this was the Hamada classification. And here uh, you can see that in different uh, two criteria that will be taken the acromia humeral space here as well as the glenohumeral joint space so in type a the acromia humeral space will be more than six and there will be a normal glenohumeral space once that starts decreasing the acromia humeral space starts decreasing then it becomes type b but again here the glenohumeral space will be uh, normal one in type c the stabilization starts the proximal humeral starts imaging out the acromia in, and uh, but here in type C the glenohumeral joint will be normal and in type four in uh, type D in the figure D you can see that uh, uh, the glenohumeral joint space also starts reducing along with the stabilization and in the final stage the humeral head starts to collapse and that is the final end stage of uh, rotator cuff acrobatic. So this is the Hamada classification based on X-rays. Next is a CT based sign. Uh, again, it is seen in uh, fatty infiltration of the supraspinatus. You can see in the axial cut, you can see this representing a fish backbone side that is due to fatty infiltration and the, uh, it is seen in uh, massive cuff tears. Next is the sanitis tangent side. This is mainly uh, used to identify muscle atrophy. So in the, in the sagittal sections where the uh, uh, spine of the scapula connects with the body of the scapula and the Y shape is appreciated maximum. We draw a tangent from the spine of the scapula to the coracoid and see the mass of the muscle inside. If the supraspinatus is crossing the tangent, then it is considered as normal as shown in the figure B here. If the, uh, if the muscle is atrophied, it will be below the tangent line and uh, you can count this as a sign of uh, massive cuff tear when there is severe muscle atrophy. Next, coming to in massive cuff tears, we have to differentiate between if it is a repairable tear or an irreparable tear, because that will help us in uh, planning the uh, planning preoperatively and to be ready with uh, uh, backup options in case the cuff is not repairable. So it is very important to identify it preoperatively to have an idea. So first parameter is the tendon retraction that is defined by Patti's classification, wherein the there is a full thickness tear with the tendon in type one there will be very little retraction. In type 2, it will be up to the humeral head. And in type 3, you can see the tendon has retracted as in this picture shown. The star shown is the tendon has retracted till the level of glenoid. So if there is patty type 3, stage 3, there is severe tendon retraction that is again a su suggestive of a full thickness tear width, which may not be repairable. Next is patty infiltration, which is the single most important uh, criteria in terms of uh, repairability. So that is defined by Gutierrez classification. Initially, it was defined in CT. Later on, it was uh, no, it is being uh, uh, described in MRI. So in, we all know that stage zero will be no fat. Stage one will be some fatty streak. Stage two, more muscle than fat. Stage three, equal amount of muscle and fat. And stage four, finally, the muscle will start replacing the muscle. So how to identify it? You can see in this picture, in subscapularis, the upper uh, subscapularis, you can see that is stage four. There is more of fat than that of muscle. 
whereas in stay in the lower subscapularis you can see there is it is stays three it is almost around equal amount of fat and muscle whereas in teres minor and infra it is stage two more muscle is there than that of fat and in supra you can see that is grade one there is some fatty streaks along so this is how you identify the uh, the you eyeball it and you identify the amount of fat in fatty infiltration in the muscles the other parameters after tendon retraction and uh, fatty infiltration as i told you is the reduced acromial distance and tangent side these are the other parameters which shows uh, which shows uh, that the cuff may be irreparable again the final one is a tendon length uh, in tendon length you can see the retracted as in shown in this picture the retracted ten tendon may have retracted muscle and will have a shorter length of the tendon as well tendon stump as well Uh, because over a period of time the tendon stump size also reduces and that uh, uh, that is a marker of uh, irreparability because when you try to pull it back to the uh, footprint the since the tendon length stump length is reduced the muscle will have to be stretched more and that it results in uh, increased uh, tension in the fixation and may result in failure also so uh, this was a study conducted by mayer et al which shows that if there is a gortlier type 3 or 4 level of fatty infiltration with a, a tendon stump length of less than 15 mm which is the critical value 15 mm of tendon length then the failure rate raises to 93% whereas in the same level of fatty infiltration if the tendon length is more than 15 mm there is only a failure rate of 33% similarly in lower stages of gutlier classification also when there is a tendon length of less than 15 mm there is 57% of failure rate whereas if the tendon length there is a significant difference when in the same levels of in the same grades of fatty infiltration with different uh, with only the difference being in tendon stump length so that is a significant marker so this also has to be calculated and kept in mind always so uh, i i have been talking about the predictors of irreparability in a massive cuff tear so uh, is it always completely predictable can we always completely predict whether a tear can be repaired or not interoperatively so uh, some surgeons believe that only after releasing the muscles in interoperatively and seeing whether it can be retracted back to the footprint then only it can be uh, judged as a repairable or an irreparable cuff tear but we should always try to have an idea preoperatively as much as possible to see if it can be repaired or not so uh, two studies were conducted one by kim et al and one by j h w et al which uh, try to understand if uh, preoperatively with mri alone whether we can try to predict the repairability and the single most important variable they found was the extent of fatty infiltration in infraspinatus muscle uh, if there is an extent of if there is a fatty infiltration of more than grade 3 in infraspinatus muscle in a massive cuff tear they, it was almost uh, always irreparable and the failure rate also was high even if tried to repair so combination of fatty is class 3 stage 3 which is a retraction of the tendon up till glenoid as well as a fat infraspinatus fatty infiltration of more than 3 if these two are come were present together they had the highest level of uh, prediction accuracy for an irreparability and it led to sensitivity it was shown that the sensitivity of 87.4% per and a specificity of 96% in terms of irreparability so uh, finally the take home message uh, we should be familiar with the definition of a massive cuff tear definition of uh, uh, pseudo paralysis when uh, diagnosing a case of massive cuff tear and then a presence of a true pseudo paralysis fatty infiltration of more than grade 2 fatty uh, retraction of stage 3 retraction of the glenoid tangent chain and tendon length of uh, tendon stump length of less than 15 mm are all to be kept in mind to identify irrepar- irreparability of a tendon preoperatively and uh, it is important to predict the irreparability and we should always be prepared with backup plans in case the tendon uh, is not suited for a repair uh, uh, thank you sir govind uh, did you uh, prepare this presentation or you had this presentation from some other pre- yes, some right. other uh, website hello sir yeah tell me you made I this presentation is yes, right prepared uh, the one uh, study i have taken from uh, uh, this this study, this uh, study i have referenced from the boomedi video rest everything i am only prepared sir excellent because um, in, uh, you 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 prepared the holy grail for uh, assessing uh, cuff repairability so kindly share this uh, presentation to all the fellows and um, uh, for, for the for the information of the fellows you have to 
look at this ppt prior to uh, washing for any cuff repair cases because he has mentioned from a to z of everything about a cuff repairability assessment so if you just study this ppt uh, your your questions will be answered so that's a very good job bagun you've done a great job so uh, look into this ppt and please share this to others because uh, nothing more is left one thing which i found interesting is uh, the uh, new classification on uh, mayes classification of the tendon length can you yes. go to that ppt yes sir. just uh, show us uh, 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 share this article to everyone and we need to find out how to measure the tendon length uh, and the width uh, either in the t1 or t2 uh, images and then uh, if we are able to reciprocate uh, the readings uh, absolutely like how it has been described in this uh, uh, literature then we may have a very interesting topic uh, for research available in uh, transverse cuff repair so uh, look into this article and let me know then we can incorporate uh, this reading in the shoulder proforma and uh, from that we can uh, bring out another article or any some interesting finding uh, because uh, whether the tendon length determines the repairability in a transosseous cuff repair we can uh, do a topic on that also yeah okay. thank you <clears throat> morning sir am i audible yes rohit proceed uh so i'll be presenting on salvageable cuff repair so the basic techniques on how to repair cuff uh, and uh, the uh, the work up to understanding a cuff tear has already been uh, covered previously so just to give a give a brief first when you have a cuff tear we need to identify a few things and assess a few things which are which are of utmost importance uh you need to identify how the type of tear is where the tear is which tendon is torn these factors are very important along with that i'll be coming with uh, coming to one, a few more factors so the tear pattern recognition is of utmost critical importance why is that important because we that needs uh, to uh, that needs to be understood to facilitate an anatomical restoration along with that like i mentioned the tendon biology has to be looked into every case has to be looked into in a individualized manner you cannot have two supra spinators uh, repaired in the same manner this will reduce the rate of failure and improve the outcomes so like govan mentioned previously uh, we have the few types of tendon tears so we have a b1 tear which is a tendinous avulsion like he said it can be in the type a that is the supra and sub or it can be type b type c type d whatever uh, type B2 is something that happens in the mid junction so this can either be in a chronic setting or in an acute setting or when you've repaired when there is a lot of tension on the tendon and the tendon is of a poor quality uh, the tendon can go into an attrition or can rupture or tear at the medial row sutures and type 3 is when basically the tendon folds back on itself forms a, a flop and sits and retracts so you need to identify how the tear is so to have a proper cuff repair you need to restore the anatomy of the shoulder joint restore the biomechanics uh, each insertion or each uh, anchor that you place should be in an appropriate manner so that the anatomy and the biomechanics are restored uh, it should be a strong rigid fixation it should promote healing so vascularity has to be taken into consideration the repair should be tensionless because if there is more tension on it there are high chances of failure this will improve the shoulder function so uh, tanuju did a study on uh, the cuff repair techniques and the current concepts uh, and he stated that the most important thing was to minimize bleeding in understanding a salvageable cuff and repairing a, a massive salvageable cuff or a, whatever a cuff so the main important thing is bleeding control now this can be because of multiple factors like patient factors fluid factors pump factors or turbulence factors so all these have to be controlled patient factors obviously the blood pressure has to be got down anti uh, 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 blood thinning agents have to be stopped like tranexamic acid and all has to be given fluid factors uh, if there is lot of bleeding you can try to use after anesthesia consent epinephrine or adrenaline in the fluid 
pump factors normally when we are doing our surgery we keep the pump pressure around 40 sometimes to 50 so that has to be controlled uh, the higher the pump pressure uh, the less the bleeding the more the visibility but that also has its own drawbacks that has to be carefully looked into and turbulence control so the number of ports that you make are leaking channels basically so these ports when not obliterated cause uh, turbulence in the uh, in the water inside thus leading to decrease in pressure which stimulates more bleeding uh, the other thing is uh, uh, extensive or non-extensive uh, bursectomy that has to be done. So this study was conducted by Ji Hoon Nam, where he studied the outcomes of limited extent, uh, bursectomy and extensive bursectomy. And he stated that extensive bursectomy had no major role or uh, it, it, in, in, it in fact uh, promoted thicker synovial uh, uh, healing rather than uh, uh, limited ex uh, bursectomy. So nowadays, the current trend is to do a bursectomy only limited to your visibility rather than doing an extensive uh, bursectomy. What extensive bursectomy does is basically it improves your vision, but then it also decreases uh, the healing potential because uh, the, the bursal tissue has growth factors which promote cuff healing. So that is taken off. So that is gone. Second thing is when extensive bursectomy is done, uh, there are chances of the bursa form reforming, but this time it will be thickened. So this thickened bursa will cause post-op complications like cuff pain and uh, the stiffness. So that has to be closely looked into. Now, how do you how do you get into that? So first, like I said, uh, to repair any cuff, you need to have adequate field of visualization that has to be brought under control by adequate control of bleeding. Secondly is you need to mobilize tissues in order to get them back to where you want to place them. So that has to be done in a stepwise or in a, uh, a preceded manner. So first what we would do is a bursectomy. A bursectomy can be of two types. You can either have a subacromial bursa or you can have a subdeltoid bursa. Depending on the nature and the type and the extensiveness of the cuff tear, you would, you would go in for a subacromial decompression or a subdeltoid decompression. Along with that, you also have to clear tissues and uh, uh, around and release uh, from the spine the scapula. The capsule has to be released in a proper manner. That would include the release of the MGHL, the AIGHL, the rotator interval. Along with that, the coracoid has to be released. Coming to bursectomy. Now, like I mentioned before, bursectomy has, is of two types, the subacromial uh, bursa and the subdeltoid bursa. Along with that, you need to identify whether there is, uh, what type of acromion there is. Either there is a hooked or a curved or a flat acromion. Accordingly, we need to do uh, 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 acromioplasty. This can be either in the form of a, a bony acromioplasty or a soft tissue acromioplasty. This, along with a limited bursectomy, is what would promote uh, ideal cuff healing and also improve visualization. Spine of the scapula. Again, there are muscles attaching. Above the scap spine, you have the supra. Below the spine, you have the infra. So this has to be released in a proper stepwise manner, in a slow manner. This release promotes uh, the pulling of the tendon again and also improves visualization for better uh, anchor placement, for better understanding, for better gripping and for taking better bites in the muscular tendinous junction. Intra-articular release, we need to do, like I said, uh, around the glenoid. So the glenoid, beyond the glenoid, you have the labral tissue and then you have the soft tissue. So this release has to be done so that the glenoid neck is cleared off completely. Once the neck is cleared off completely, the tension on the capsule is released. This promotes release of the capsular structures and also helps in getting the, ten uh, the tendon back to the footprint area. Coracoid release. Coracoid release, you have the coracohumeral ligaments which have to be released. This has to be in the form of an anterior release, the supraspinatus release. And also, like I mentioned, you have to go till the base of the coracoid. This has to be done through the anterior lateral portal. 
it can either be done through the anterior inferior or anterior superior portal depending on the placement of the portals or sometimes uh, some surgeons only prefer to take an anterior portal and then work their way through after taking uh, after looking through inside out technique uh, coming to uh, releases now this release is basically of two types you have the anterior interval slide and the posterior interval slide so the anterior interval slide comprises of basic subscap and the supra the posterior interval slide comprises of basically the supra and the infra so what is an interval slide an interval slide is nothing but these muscles are released off from the scapular region on the lateral aspect this in turn in turn helps to catch the tendon and pull it more on the footprint. Now, there are drawbacks to that as well. Uh, but before going to the drawbacks, let's just have a look at what exactly an anterior slide is. So basically, what you do is you take the coracoid as the landmark. You make an anterior lateral portal. You start from the anterior part to the medial part of the biceps root and you go on clearing it. Now, the plane that is to be uh, 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 formed is between the rotator interval and the supraspinatus in line with the base of the coracoid. This is done until you expose the base of the coracoid. Now, what this does is, again, like I mentioned, this will help in the uh, pulling of the anterior cuff, anterior and the superior cuff. So that includes the subscap and the supra. What is the posterior interval slide? Posterior interval slide is basically uh, a plane is created between the supra and the infra. Uh, through the posterior lateral portal, it has gone all the way till the muscular tendon is junction inside on the uh, sp uh, scapula. Uh, now, what happens is this promotes uh, pulling of the tendon on the post the posterior tendon. So basically, the infraspinatus uh, and the sup uh, the supraspinatus. So what this does is there are drawbacks to this. Like I mentioned, main main major drawback is decreased vascularity. So what happens is the, vas the vessels or the blood, uh, the nutrition of these muscles is majorly derived from the medial aspect of the structures till the tendinous junction. So when you go on for releases, you tend to obliterate and occlude blood vessels, thus decreasing blood supply. Now this, uh, if the tendon is of a grade 1 or a grade 2, it doesn't uh, matter much, but if the degeneration is around uh, grade 3 or grade 4. It makes a significant difference, thus uh, causing re-tests, re-ruptures and a cuff failure. So if there's a small tear, you would just like to mobilize from the base of the coracoid on the bursal side. If there's a medium tear, you would like to mobilize. Along with that, you would do a subacromial and a subdeltoid decompression and an acromioplasty in the form of a sub, uh, sub, uh, soft tissue or a uh, bony. If there's a medium tear which is cleaved, then you would have to do a capsular uh, cuff beneath. So that can be a bilaminar repair depending on the type of tear. A large tear would be an entire subtendon capsule has to be released. The plexus of vein, bursa, bursa has to be done properly. And a large tear with a superior migration, the capsule has to be released outside the labrum and you have to perform these interval slides. Uh, now coming to the tendon quality, like Govin had mentioned before, uh, according uh, to the tendon fatty infiltration, we have grade one, two, three, four. So, uh, sometimes when you're, uh, facing a massive tear or when you're facing a big tear, uh, the tendon quality or a chronic tear, the tendon quality is of, uh, very poor, uh, quality. So you cannot, uh, properly take in sutures, which will stain the cuff. These sutures tend to cut through, may it, be, may it be in an acute setting or in a chronic setting, which will result in a cuff failure. So to prevent this from happening, there's a technique called as the Mason Allen technique. The Mason Allen technique is basically nothing but taking one horizontal stitch that acts as a rip stop stitch. So basically it prevents the tendon from ripping. That's why it's called a rip stop stitch. Along with this, the second stitch is taken in a vertical fashion. This can either be in a, uh, a simple stitch or a mattress stitch, but that is vertical. So a cross type of configuration is formed. So what happens here is even if the tendon is of a poor quality, uh, the ripstop stitch prevents the vertical stitch from cutting through the tendon, thus causing a cuff failure. Coming to marginal conversions, 
marginal convergence when you have this l shape or in reverse l shape type of tear uh, is of utmost importance uh, what happens is we tend to uh, take bites in the tendinous junction and put it in the footprint and repair it but uh, the edges like the supra or the infra they are apart so that forms a small rent now, when the tendon is of a good quality, it doesn't make much of a difference. But again, when you're talking about salvaging something that is uh, first you thought was non-salvageable, these small things make a huge difference. So you need to properly stitch this back. So the supra and the infra has to be fused together. This is done by marginal convergence. Marginal convergence is nothing but a side-to-side -side stitch. Uh, converting medial and lateral footprints together. What this does is promotes wound healing, reduces the tension on each tendon. So you remember the, the diagram that we have, uh, uh, the, the cuff is nothing but basically, cuff repair is nothing but basically a suspension of bridges, the suspensory bridges. So the technically, the more number of anchors that you put in reduces the tension on each bite. Similarly, when you do marginal convergence, it reduces the tension. So it promotes tendon to tendon type of healing. It reduces the gap and it promotes tensionless repair. Uh, sometimes it also happens so that you try everything and the tendon cannot be brought back to the footprint. In such cases, you have to medialize the footprint. So what you have to do is basically where you would place your anchor, you in an ideal position, you are not able to do that. So you have to place it in a medial position. So normally 3 to 10 mm medial advancement of the tendon does not have any significant drawbacks in a uh, chronic setting. But if it's more than one centimeter, obviously there are high chances of failure and the outcomes are poor and it's restricted. So this has to be looked into with a pinch of salt. When you're preparing the footprint, the... Uh, decortication is of utmost importance. What this does is this promotes uh, visual, uh, this uh, blood supply out there. It promotes wound healing by you, when you decorticate. Basically, it creates a bare and a raw area for the footprint to, uh, for the tendon to nicely sit on and heal on. So the tendon normally any tendon normally heals at the mouth where the uh, the tendon is sitting and where the bone is there. So this incorporation has to be done properly. So if the tendon, uh, if the fo footprint, the tuberosity is not created properly, that is if there is no decortication or if uh, if you medialize it and there are some uh, cartilages uh, patches, then this will not uh, help in promoting the tendon healing properly. Thus, it will promote a poor outcome and maybe even a, a cuff failure. So how else do you promote this? So what you do is uh, when you're making, when you take bites, when you prepare the footprint, uh, you do a technique called as the crimson duvet. Crimson duvet is nothing but making small punctures or small uh, holes in the footprint area, the bare area. So what this does is basically it promotes vascularity. It forms blood clots. And this helps in the tendon sitting better on the footprint and also helps in uh, early and quicker and better uh, healing and fusion rates between the tendon and the bone. So take home message is basically nothing but identify the type of the tendon tear first, where which tendon is torn. Secondly, identify the quality of the tendon tear. You need to have a good tendon quality to have a successful repair. A poor tendon quality will promote a failure. High initial fixation strength has to be looked into. The repair should be tension-free. Minimal gap formation. Maintain stability till healing. And like I always said, always individual patient factors have to be adapted to each individual case uh, accordingly. Thank you. Uh, Rohit, any mention on the muzzle uh, pedicle flap elevation by Ashish Gupta's article? Because that is also a very important factor in um, uh, making an irreducible cuff tear reducible. So that also plays a very important role. But apart from that, you have mentioned all the uh, uh, procedures that are needed to make a cuff tear repairable in a tension-free manner. That's, that's very good.
um as i told uh, the pre operative evaluation is very very important and uh, finding out whether a cuff tear is repairable or not depends upon uh, the quality of the tendon um but particular importance has to be given to the type of um, uh, delamination that you are dealing with uh, if it is a single uh, layer it's not a dual layer if it is a single layer then you will not have any issues with um, the cup reducibility but when it comes to dual layer that's where the problem starts because you have the superficial layer which is uh, very poor in its uh, tensile strength and uh, the deep layer which is absolutely strong now the poor quality tensile strength layer that is layer 1 2 and 3 is easily uh, um, um, reducible it comes like a thin flimsy tissue which can be reattached onto the gt without any tension and you may have a false impression that you are doing a very good cuff repair because it's coming back onto the footprint but that is not true because this uh, layer is somewhat uh, similar to that of a bursal layer and uh, given some amount of uh, um, force and when you try to mobilize uh, during the rehabilitation procedure this uh, layer can easily give way the uh, importance has to be given to repairing the layer 4 and 5 which is a deep thicker layer which has got its attachment onto the uh, medial margin of the footprint that is near the uh, juxta articular area and if you are not in a position to bring that layer back onto the uh, gt then uh, there is trouble waiting to happen and that's where you have to follow all these uh, measures of uh, margin convergence then uh, release the cuff on its under surface that is supraglenoid area as well as the the bacromel area but um, and now uh, the problem with the uh, rotator interval release or margin convergence is the you are definitely devascularizing the uh, tendon especially as the musculo tendinous junction and whenever you are trying to suture it back it's going to heal by fibrosis and that's a area of uh, loss of vascularity so if you want anything to heal it's not going to heal properly uh, so uh, i i personally do not uh, advise uh, rotator interval release i think um, uh, the most sensible uh, way to make a cuff repair uh, reducible is to elevate the muscle pedicle from the scapular body <clears throat> something similar to how you do a surgery for a scapular fracture fixation uh, where you just release the muscle from the scapular body and then fix the put a plate and then you leave it as if the muscle functions really very well the critical point of uh, contact is at the muscular tendinous junction and there should be vascularity restored in this area loss of vascularity in this area is common in case of a uh, um, no interval slide and uh, i prefer not to do that uh, so we have to wait for uh, the paper by uh, dr ashish gupta um, so what are the long term outcomes of uh, these muscle pedicle flap elevation in case of a irreparable rotator cuff tears uh, and uh, this can be a very good substitute for uh, the tendon transfers the superior capsular reconstructions and other uh, salvageable cuff repair procedures but keep in mind now at present uh, five years ago we didn't have many options at present we have various options to make a uh, irreparable cuff tear repairable and we have to choose wise according to the patient's age activity level and the quality of tendon that you are uh, dealing with uh, in general if uh, the uh, muscle tear if the tendon tear is massive but a single layer it has it usually has a good prognosis if it is massive and a dual layer then you are uh, waiting for trouble so we have to be extremely cautious in repairing each and individual layer in separately which means the um, uh, the uh, inferior or the articular sided layer should be separately fixed onto the gt and the superficial layer has to be separately fixed which means use of lot uh, more number of anchors but uh, this can be mitigated uh, with the use of transosseous cuff repair which has got a fantastic advantage of bringing all the tissues onto the gt and fixing it in toto and ensuring complete coverage so that's where uh, the transosseous is uh, superior to any other uh, repair methods um in uh, while dealing with a massive cuff repairs so uh, if if you guys are able to get to the presentation of uh, govind and uh, rohit i think you'll have a uh, 90 to 95% understanding about how to deal with the cuff tear so uh, as a whole uh, today's presentation was fantastic you guys did a great job thank you thank you uh so i have one doubt i just wanted to clarify uh, one thing uh basically so i wanted to know uh, how would anyone how should we deal with it if we have a tendon uh, degeneration of type 3 say for example with the teres minor hypertrophy 
so in that case should we go in for a repair or should we go in for an augmentation technique and if we go you in mean, for a you repair, mean uh, muscle fatty degeneration of great yes sir. yes sir okay okay no there is nothing like tendon degeneration muscle fatty degeneration muscle, of great muscle, muscle fatty yes a muscle fatty the tendon yeah, quality muscle, muscle fat yeah the muscle fatty de degeneration uh, above grade 2 is always a bad prognosticating uh, features so always mm. have a backup of uh, supplementary procedures in the form of uh, tendon transfers or superior capsular reconstructions uh, etc or even uh, if you are available in if you are going to practice abroad then uh, the patch graft you know allograft patch yeah so but now there's a uh, min teres minor hypertrophy as well so do we even go in for a cuff repair teres minor hypertrophy is a compensatory hypertrophy which means uh, 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 the teres is overworking So what will yes, happen sir. is uh, the infraspinatus and supraspinatus are given way, and they are right, not sir. going to work properly. Now right, this teres minor uh, hypertrophy will induce posterior translation of the femoral head. Right. This will listen. Uh, uh, this will lead not only to uh, superior migration of the femoral head. It will also lead to posterior migration. That will classically lead to uh, the type two B two glenoid, which is uh, seen in uh, the uh, no glenoid uh, osteoarthritis. That is uh, the biconcave glenoid. So, yes, in order to make sure that the patient does not develop this in future, it is mandatory for you to repair the infraspinatus, supraspinatus, and supplement it with additional fixations also. Okay. Fine. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Ah, uh, Sham, you are asking, yes, Sham. Yes, sir. Good. Ah, uh, sir, so, Sham, you mentioned that uh, dual layer uh, tear carries a. Uh, Goddard prognosis when it is in a single layer. When you repair, also I have to go in a separate uh, articular versus a yes, superior sir. layer. Rather, yes, uh, you can go for a conversion dual layer into a single layer, and then you can uh, <clears throat> make it as a uh, single layer sorry. of tear. Uh, the problem with the, the dual layer tear is that uh, the inferior layer cannot be brought back to cover the entire footprint of the GT. The inferior layer, the layer four and five. Has its maximum extent only onto the medial margin of the footprint, that is near the articular surface. Whereas the superior layer has got its extension; it can come and cover the GT uh, completely lateral. Now, even if we try to make the dual layer as a single layer by taking some stitches and uh, fixing it up, we need that thicker part to be sitting tight on the uh, medial margin of the footprint, and that's the reason why Pascal Bolo and the great uh, shoulder surgeons are saying they use. <laughs> uh <clears throat> medial anchors they fix the uh, inferior layers first onto the medial margin of the footprint and then they uh, address the superficial layer now whether converting the dual layer into single layer has got any significance we don't know but what they are trying to aim is make sure that the uh, inferior layer sits tight onto the uh, medial margin of the footprint it i don't think it may be possible to achieve that in the uh, Uh, in uh, by converting it to a single layer because um, um, uh, we are essentially when we do the single when we tie both the layers together uh, it becomes as one total unit and you may not be able to visualize the repair that is a very important uh, thing uh, whereas when you address these layers individually when you first tie the super uh, the deep layer onto the medial footprint you can visualize the repair you can ensure that there is no tension in the repair. and uh, that helps us in uh, giving uh, a protocol for the physio and all those uh, uh, recovery guidelines i think um, uh, yeah what you have suggested is correct but whether it will be successful in assessing the repair intraoperatively we don't know okay okay thank you uh, good morning sir is my screen visible sir Uh, yes, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, I'll be talking about the anatomy of the knee joints, sir. Uh, so first, the uh, structure of the knee joint. Uh, it's a double condyloid joint. Has six degrees of freedom of motion, and it's a triaxial motion. The flexion extension is about zero to one forty degrees, and uh, varus valgus six to eight degrees in extension. And internal external rotation will be twenty five to thirty degree in flexion. So coming to the femoral articular surface, the femoral condyles uh, have a large anterior posterior convexity and a slight convexity in the frontal plane. 
So anterior posterior convexity will be smaller uh, curvature posteriorly. So given the obliquity of the shaft of the femur, the lateral condyle lies more uh, directly in line with the shaft. So the articular surface, if you see the medial condyle, it is two-thirds longer than the lateral condyle. And medial condyle extends distally than the laterally. So, so that the dis despite the angulation of the shaft of the femur, the distal end of the femur is essentially horizontal. So the intercondylar knots will be separating the two condyles distally and posteriorly. The lateral wall gi will give origin to the uh, anterior cruciate ligament and the medial wall will give origin to the PCL. Uh... So coming to the tibial articular surface, uh, the medial and uh, medial condyle articulating surface is about 50 times larger, 50% uh, larger and three times thicker. And the intercondylar tubercles become lodged in the intercondylar knots during the knee extension. So the articular incongruency of the knee due to large condyles of the femur placed on the shallow concavities of the tibial condyle, it is reduced because of an ax, uh, reduced and congruency is enhanced by a structure, no, uh, structure this is the menisci. So the menisci are two crescentric fibrocartilaginous structures. The medial uh, menisci is semicircular while the lateral is for four fifth of a ring. The functions of the menisci includes uh, transmission of load across the joint. Enhancement of articular con conformity, distribution of synovial fluid across the articular surface, and prevention of soft tissue impingement during joint motion. Since the medial meniscus, it is more mobile, it is more, uh, it is torn more frequently. And uh, <clears throat> if you see the innervation of the posterior horn, denser, it is denser than the anterior horn. So it carries greater proprioception. So attachments in the menisci uh, to the tibial condyle, they are attached by the coronoid ligaments, to the petula by the petula meniscal ligaments. The anterior horns are attached with the transverse ligaments. The medial meniscus attached to the PCL and popliteus by, a cor by coronoid ligaments. And some fibers of ACL may join anterior and posterior horns of lateral meniscus. And medial meniscus attached to MCL and semimembranous muscle. So coming to the tibiofemoral alignment and axis, the uh, mechanical axis of the lower limb, it is a line drawn uh, in a long leg AP radiograph uh, from the center of the femoral head to the center of the uh, knee, knee joint to the uh, talar dome. It should uh, project through the center of the knee joint uh, describing a neutral mechanical axis. When it is on the lateral side, it will be valgus and when it is on the medial side, it will be uh, varus. So mechanical axis of femur is the center of the femur head to the intercondylar knots. And uh, mechanical axis of the tibia will be from the center of the tibial plateau to the tibial plafond. So angle between mechanical axis of the femur and de uh, tibia determines the valgus or varus uh, deviation. Any medial or lateral subluxation of the knee joint is here disregarded and uh, rotation affects me mechanical axis of femur apparent in the radiogram. So tibial articular surface has three degree of varus and femur art articular surface has nine degree of valgus. Uh, the weight bearing line follows the mechanical axis. So the weight bearing stresses on the knee joint in bilateral static stance, they are equally distributed between the median and the lateral condyle. Uh, the normal force distribution is altered in uh, whenever uh, there is a unilateral stance, introduction of any dynamic forces to the joint, increase or decrease in normal tibiofemoral angle. So coming to genu arum and valgum, genu valgum is the medial uh, tibiofemoral angle when it is greater than 195 degrees. So increased compressive force on lateral condyle and uh, increased tensile uh, stress on the medial structures are there. So uh, coming to genu arum, the medial tibial angle will be uh, greater than, uh, sorry, less than 180 degrees. And increased compressive, here increased compressive forces occur on the medial condyle and increased tensile stresses are laterally. This co constant overload of lateral or medial condyle uh, causes damage to the articular cartilage. So menisci distribute and absorb large forces across the knee joint and compressive forces in the dynamic knee. In normal gait is about two to three times the body weight. While running, it is about five to six times the body weight. And menisci assume about 40 to 60% of this imposed load and any removal of the menisci will uh, cause six to seven times increase in load on the tibial articular cartilage. Elimination of any tibiofemoral angle causes increased by 25% compression on the medial meniscus. The knee joint capsule is a large, complexly attached and lacks with several recesses. Along with associated ligaments, it is critical in restricting any displacement and rotation of the tibia and a flex knee. 
I mean to the external reticular retinaculum, it has two layers, the superficial transverse layer and the deep longitudinal layer. And uh, it connects the petala and the femoral condyle, that's a petalofemoral ligament. The lateral petalofemoral ligament connected to both vastus lateralis and the IT band. So uh, IT band and fascia lata are accompanied posteriorly by the biceps femoris. And uh, it acts as a dynamic and static stabilizer of the knee. Any injuries associated with anteromedial or uh, anterior uh, lateral rotational instability. Uh, knee joint ligaments, they control excessive knee extension, varus and valgus stresses at the knee joint, anterior or posterior displacement of tibia, uh, medial or lateral rotation of tibia and uh, rotatory stabilization. So coming to the med uh, MCL, it resists valgus stresses, checks lateral rotation of the tibia, Back, it acts as a backup restraint to uh, anti tibial displacement in absence of uh, ACL and uh, LCL it resists varus st uh, st resists lateral rotation plus uh, posterior displacement of tibia and resists varus stresses. So the iliotibial tibial band it con it's consistently taut regardless of joint position. Fibro con connections between the IT band, biceps femoris, and vastus lateralis through. Lateral intermuscular septum form a sling behind the lateral femoral condyle, which assists in the ACL in preventing a posterior displacement. And the IT band goes posteriorly in knee flexion, la this lateral pull of patella and causes progressive lateral tilting as the flexion increases. So, knee joint ligaments coming to the cruciate ligaments, they have fibroblasts, type 1 and type 3 collagen, fibrocartilage. So, here the sharing and the compressive stress is responsible for the development of fibrocartilaginous areas. In the ACL, about 5 to, it occurs at 5 to 10 centimeters proximal to tibial incision. The ligament impinges in the anterior rim of the internal condyle of fossa when the knee is completely extended. So, in the PCL, it occurs in the middle one-third uh, twisting of ligament. So, coming to anterior crucial ligament, uh, consists of anterior medial bundle and the posterior lateral bundle. So, in knee extension, the anterior medial bundle is lax, but the posterior lateral bundle is taut. When the knee is in flexion, the anterior medial bundle is taut and the posterior lateral bundle is lax. So, the intermediate third of ACL is taut in all positions. The primary restraint, it is acting as a primary restraint to anterior displacement of tibia. And it checks the excessive medial rotation. It acts as an antagonist to quadriceps and they are synergistic to the hamstrings. So, posterior cruciate ligament is a short lesser, shorter, less oblique. The anterior medial bundle and here also the anterior medial bundle is lax during extension, but uh, uh, posterior lateral bundle is taut. But in uh, when in knee flexion, the anterior medial bundle is taut and posterior lateral bundle is lax. So, the primary it acts the primary restraint to the posterior displacement of the tibia and restraints productions uh, productions. Uh, produces uh, rotation of the tibia. So, instrumental, it is instrumental in creating lateral rotation of tibia, critical for locking of joint. So, knee joint movements, it's a triaxial motion, primary motions, uh, as already told, flexion or extension is the main, medial uh, lateral rotation and uh, they occur about changing, but uh, def definable axes uh, serve the weight bearing function of the lower extremity. And, uh, so, they can undergo tibial femoral displacement anteriorly and posteriorly, abduction adduction through varus valgus forces, result of joint incongruence and variation in ligamentous elasticity, no, not considered a part of function of joint, rather a part of cost of tremendous uh, compromise between the mobility and stab stability. So flexion and extension, the axis passes horizontally through the uh, femoral condyles at an angle to the mechanical and anatomical axis. The obliquely, it ca causing the tibia to move from a position slightly lateral to the femur in full extension to a position medial to the femur in full flexion. So, the uh, flexion extension, the axis, the uh, most considerable extent through the range of motion and uh, the pathway, if you see, it is uh, forming a J shape. Uh, moving posteriorly and superiorly on the femoral condyle with increasing in flexion. So, uh, the uh, flexion, the hip joint position can influence the knee ROM. So, when, when flexion pa pa in passive position, the 130 to 140 degrees can be done. And the hip joint, when ex hyperextended, uh, stretched stretch rectus femoris muscle becomes insufficient, so less than 120 degrees. So, hip and knee flex together can produce 160 degrees. The requirement of knee flexion, 
and for normal gait is 60 degrees on climbing st climbing stairs 80 degrees sitting down and rising from chair uh, greater than 90 degrees activities beyond uh, simulate, uh, sim simple mobility task is greater than 115 degrees so on extension normal hyper hyperextension is 5 to 10 degrees more than that it will lead to excessive uh, knee hyperextension leading to genuine recurvate Range of limitation at ankle joint may cause restriction in knee joint flexion or extension. Limitations of ankle dorsiflexion restrict the knee flexion and limitation of plantar flexion restrict the knee extension. Axial rotation uh, provides second degree of freedom and uh, terminal or automatic uh, rotation, in, it is involved in the locking mechanism of knee and occurs with close packing of knee joint and doesn't contribute to degree of freedom. So, the axis runs through or close to medial tibial intercondylar tubercle and it is related to motion of tibia occurring due to articular incongruence and joint laxity. So, uh, range of motion, uh, range of rotation depends on the knee position. When the locked knee, there is no rotation possible at 90 degrees, 60 to 70 degree and uh, range of axial rotation uh, decreases as the knee approaches full extension of flexion. So, range of lat uh, lateral rotation is 0 to 40 degrees greater than the uh, range of medial rotation, 0 to 30 degrees. So, arthrokinematics, uh, the flexion, it's uh, 0 to 25 degree flexion cause rolling of femoral condyle over the tibia. Uh, greater than 25 degrees flexion uh, cause roll rolling accompanied by anti-egg light, just sufficient to create nearly uh, pure spin of the femur. So, the anterior glide occurred due to tension in the ACL as the femur rolls posteriorly and the wedge shape of meniscus caused oblique contact force of meniscus on femur causing anterior shear on femur, femur on meniscus, posterior shear on uh, meniscus, that will be second shear. So, in extension, initially as rolling of femoral condyle on tibial condyle, uh, the lateral femoral condyle glide posteriorly to continue extension of the femur as pure spin and posterior glide occur due to tension in PCL and wedge shape of the meniscus. So, motion or distortion of meniscus with flexion and extension are important components of uh, motions. So, coming to the next uh, locking, uh, the extension of femur to 30 degrees of flexion, uh, shorter lateral femoral condyle completes its ro uh, rolling and gliding motion. Uh, on continued extension, the longer medial condyle continued to roll and glide posteriorly while the lateral condyle is halted. The continued motion of the medial condyle results in medial rotation of the femur on the tibia pivoting over the fixed lateral condyle. Most evident in the final 5 degree of extension and this uh, the medial rotation is not voluntary or uh, produced by muscular forces. It is automatic or terminal. This rotation brings the joint in locked position. So, tibial tubercles lodged into the intercondylar notch and menisci are tightly interposed between the tibial and fem femoral condyle. Ligaments are taught. Hence, locking or this is the known as the screw home mechanism. So, during unlocking, to initiate flexion, knee must be first unlocked. So, me, uh, medially rotated femur cannot, cannot flex in sagittal plane but uh, must laterally rotate before the flexion begins which happens automatically by reflection forces. If there is an ex external restraint to unlocking of the femur, joint ligaments and menisci can be damaged as uh, femur is forced into flexion oblique to the sagittal plane in which its structures are oriented. Uh, the axial rotation axis lies at the medial intercondylar tubercle. The medial condyle axis a pivot uh, while the lateral condyle move through the greater arc of motion in both direction of the motion. Rotation. So, the uh, yeah. tibia are free to move, uh, ro rotation of the tibia at the knee on relatively fixed femoral condyle. So, lateral ro uh, rotation, the medial tibia, uh, medial tibial condyle moves sli slightly anteriorly, while the lateral uh, tibial condyle moves a large distance posteriorly. And the medial rotation, medial tibial condyle moves posteriorly and the uh, lateral tibial condyle moves uh, anteriorly by large distance. Uh, and uh, this tibia is fixed uh, rotation of femur at knee. The similar motion occurs, uh, motions occur of femoral condyle on fixed uh, tibial condyles. So, the coming to the knee joint muscles, the flexors include the semimembranous, semitendinous, biceps femoris, sartorius, gracilis, popliteus, gastrocnemius. The extensors include the quadriceps femoris, rectus femoris, rastus intermedius, vastus lateralis, and vastus medialis. 
So knee joint stabilizers, they can be classified according to the function, a static dynamic differentiation, structure capsular, extra capsular, and location based on compartment. So the static stabilizers include the joint capsule, coronary ligaments, menisco patellar uh, ligament, and uh, patellofemoral ligament, uh, lateral collateral ligament, and medial collateral ligament, the anterior cruciate ligament, and posterior cruciate ligament, oblique popliteal and arcuate lig uh, ligaments, and uh, tra transverse ligament, and uh, I, 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 IT band and menisci. So the dynamic stabilizers include the quadriceps, extensor retinaculum, pesensinus, popliteus, biceps femoris, and semimembranous. So medial compartment it includes medial para medial patellar retinaculum, the medial collateral ligament, the oblique popliteal ligament, and the uh, posterior cruciate ligament, medial gastrocnemius head, and pesensinus and semi semimembranosus. The lateral compartment includes IT band, biceps femoris, popliteus, lateral collateral ligament, menisco femoral, arcuate, anterior cruciate ligament, and the lateral patellar retinaculum. So coming to the patellofemoral joint, so it is anatomically uh, eccentric pulley. It increases the labor arm of the extensor mechanism, displaces the force vectors of quadriceps and patellar tendons away from the center of rotation of the knee. So uh, the mechanism of mechanism to reduce friction between the quadriceps and uh, tendon uh, Access, uh, and femoral condyles and the functional mobility uh, without restriction of the knee joint is, depends on its mobility. So motions of the patella, patella flexion and extension, then rotations of the patella, medial patella rotation and lateral patella rotation, then uh, medial patella tilting and lateral patella tilting and patella shift, medial and lateral. So in fully extended or neutral knee, patella lies on the femoral sulcus with little or no contact with it. With increasing flexion, area of contact increases and shifts from distal to proximal. So this can be represented here. Uh, about 10 to 20 degrees, in, uh, it is in the inferior articular surface. 60 degrees is in the mid portion. 90 degrees goes to superior portion. And 120 degrees medially and laterally with the femoral condyles, body tendon, and trochlea. So the vertical vertical patella positions related to patella tendon length uh, coming to in the uh, insal and salvati ratio uh, the ratio of length of the patella tendon to the length of the patella uh, it it is when it is greater than one point three it's abnormally high patella or patella alta and when it is less than zero point eight it's patella baja. So increases with uh, in, increase increasing flexion as force vectors of quadriceps and patellar tendons becomes more parallel to the joint reaction force. About two to five times the body weight is during the activities of daily living, and seven to eight times while squat, squatting, and uh, exceeding uh, exceed uh, it exceeds ex yield strength of the polyethylene. So patellar femoral joint is under permanent control of two restraining mechanisms that cross each other at right angles. So that a transverse group of stabilizers and the longitudinal group of stabilizers. So the transverse group of stabilizers, it includes the medial and lateral extensor retinacula, joining the vastus medialis and lateralis. The medial and lateral patellar femoral ligament, <coughs> the medial patellar femoral ligament contributes 53% of the total force resisting the displacement of the patella when the knee is in full extension. So a iliopatellar band attaching the patella to the iliotibial tract. The longitudinal stabilizers include patellar tendon inferiorly, quadriceps tendon superiorly, patellotibial ligaments. Uh, these can stabilize the patella through patellofemoral compression. The compression is essentially absent when the, in the extended knee, leaving patella unstable. In exaggerated extension or genu recurvatum, the longitudinal stabilizers may actually distract patella from the femoral sulcus. Governed by passive and uh, uh, positioning, it uh, is governed by the passive and dynamic pulls of the structures surrounding it. Active extension or passive stretching of quadriceps patella is pulled by the quadriceps. Re uh, resultant pull of quadriceps FQ and uh, patella ligaments is FPL. So uh, FQ and FPL do don't coincide, but uh, when uh, and patella is pulled laterally, increase in oblique obliquity force of the quadriceps or force of uh, patellar ligaments increase the lateral force. Increase in the lateral force cause increase in compression on the lateral patellar facet. Well, last in the Q angle is described by Havid. Uh, angle between the extended anatomical axis of the femur and line between the center of the patella and tibial tubercle. So quadriceps acts as the primary, uh, primarily in line with the anatomical axis of the femur except Vastus medialis oblicus the media, medializes the patella in terminal extension. 
Aynen kesin. Katika et fade basic uh, anatomy just uh, it's okay but for the practical applied anatomy or not covered topic yes so for the, it's like a more of like a pg presentation rather than fellows it should be more in depth knowledge it should be applied aspect that's okay. very important in understanding the anatomy this is very basic and you should know in and out of uh, each aspect uh, yes. i don't know how much uh, depth did you understand uh, this anatomy and uh, these things every day are going to apply in your practice. That's very important. Yes, sir. So what are the structures uh, which you will address? Suppose if you're balancing the knee in extension, if it is tight in various knee. So what are the structures you will address? What are the structures normally will be tight in extension? What are the structures with tight in flexion? And what are the structures with both tight in both flexion and extension? Can you explain about this thing? I'm asking about varus. Uh, yeah. Suppose if you are operating, sir, in, uh, <clears throat> sir, in uh, tight and flexion uh, will be uh, the qua, uh, qua, quadris, uh, quadriceps, and uh, in ex, uh, extension it will be uh, hamstring, sir. And... No, I am very specifically asking. Suppose if you are operating the knee. If it is yes, a varus sir. knee, you want to release medially. Yes, sir. And which structure you will release in extension? Yeah, which yeah. structures you release yeah, in flexion? You don't uh, release hamstring or quadriceps. Yes, sir. So, uh, uh, release the uh, deep MCL, sir, in, uh, in flexion. Uh, during extension, the uh, uh, po posterior capsule, then... Uh, Posterior capsule and uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So can you yeah. understand? So yes. this is very important because unless otherwise, if you read correlating with your anatomy with applied anatomy, and this presentation doesn't make any uh, value add any value in your uh, curriculum, and uh, you're not going to apply this thing in your practice. It's okay. like just reading the slides. It 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 won't make any. Uh, impact in your practice, Karthik. You have to uh, reframe your uh, presentation in the way that uh, the slides and each points it should understand and then present. Okay. Sir. Number one. Number two. Can you uh, can you tell me what is the paradoxical rollback? You mentioned about this orthokinematics. What is paradoxical rollback? What is rollback? What is paradoxical rollback? Paradoxical rollback is when we are like, uh, flexing the knee, the femoral condyle is uh, posteriorly uh, uh, rollback is occurring and in the end stage it's uh, uh, gliding is occurring. So. so when it will happen, paradoxical rollback? Okay. Knee the, okay. Uh, uh, you can redo your presentation. Once again, in the next session or uh, in your uh, next uh, arthroplasty session, uh, that should be more applied and it should be okay. useful for you. Okay. okay. Rather than just by reading the slides, uh, it, it won't solve your purpose. Okay. Shyam, what's your opinion, Shyam? Thank you. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, I want Karthik to be more in depth and uh, more applied aspects he should cover. That's what much. Can we give a topic for him uh, next week for the applied anatomy of uh, the knee biomechanics and things? Uh, maybe we'll give some more time for him, sure. uh, uh, Shyam. So sure. probably, sure. yeah, uh, he might take another few weeks, uh, one or two weeks, but uh, he should understand in depth and then he should start preparing it. That's what okay. I feel. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Karthik, Thank please you. make we'll note of for it. the next class. Then. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
So can we end the session, sir? Thank you.